Hello, and thank you for joining the POCUS Certification Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. This webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. Today's presentation will include a PowerPoint presentation and a time for Q&A. And uh, today's topic is 30-Minute Ultrasound Physics University and our speaker is James Day. Welcome, James. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about James. James has been a cardiac sonographer since 1992, who in addition to providing a scanning service business for private practices, was also a clinician at the Urban uh, Teaching Hospital in the Philadelphia metro region. He has worked as a medical science liaison for Cardinal Health, developing a startup microbubble product, and for GE Healthcare in clinical applications, representing the Vivid7 ultrasound line. As a clinical trial manager for Dermasonics, a startup company utilizing ultra-low frequency ultrasound to deliver drugs via transdermal pharmaceutical patches, James was involved with human pilot studies on both coasts and overseas. While at Thomas Jefferson University Medical College, James managed 40 simulation programs and taught all modules of focus, including anatomy and physiology, gross anatomy, physical exam lectures, gel rounds, resonance orientation, ultrafest in Philadelphia, as well as private workshops. He's worked tirelessly to integrate focus into the medical school curriculum. James is presently involved with innovation in the Focus Certification Academy at Antelius as a global ultrasound specialist. Thank you, James, for being here and um, let us begin. Welcome. And if you, James, just wanna unmute yourself so we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, hello out there in ultrasound land, physicians, nurses, technicians, technologists, PAs, anybody with a transducer in their hand. We are gonna talk about, which is typically a dry, boring topic, uh, ultrasound physics, the fundamentals. Um, I'm gonna to try to make this a little fun for you guys. We might go a little fast, but I just want you to know we're, this is not a deep dive. This is a cursory intro to we've condensed it to what we call a 30 minute ultrasound physics university. So at the beginning here, wow, look at that. That's a crop circle. That's a geometric representation of pi 3.14. And if you stick around by the end of the presentation, I'll show you all the secrets and explain a little bit about it. Uh, so ultrasound physics came uh, about uh, by echolocation. Um, it was also pioneered by um, Joseph Holmes and Douglas Howerly. Here they are at a, doing an ultrasound bath scanner in 1957. I don't know about you guys, but that looks uh, pretty sketchy there, uh, electricity and water together like that. Um, as we've seen, the ultrasound has evolved into handheld devices. Uh, you see a couple of your favorites maybe you're using. I don't, I don't have a butterfly up there, but you can see a transducer attached to a cell phone. There's a V1 from GE. Here's one for inserting uh, IJ cannulation. Um, standard ultrasound machine. You guys probably have one of these in your ER. They've gone from oven size to laptop size. Here's a little bit of the knobology. Probably mostly you want on and off depth and gain. It's pretty much all you need to deal with. Just like a tool belt, there's all kinds of pros for different applications, all the way from linear to phase array to different kinds of endocavitary probes. Um, basically, you're, you're dealing with two high and low frequencies. The, the high frequency probe is superficial. You're looking at, you know, um, probably muscle skeletal, soft tissue or IV insertion. And then, of course, your deep frequency probe is more for EFAS, cardiac, and et cetera. Uh, so here we are, boom, ultrasound physics. So to understand and use ultrasound, we have to go back to the future with our flux capacitor. Sound waves are a series of repeating pressure waves that propagate through a medium. It's very mechanical. So we see across time and pressure there. The pressure waves are measured by frequency, also known as Hertz, cycles per second. 
Sound frequencies, when we're dealing with medical ultrasound, we're talking about uh, two megahertz to 20 megahertz. Um, I know that, you know, your dog and your cat, uh, typically the dog hears in a higher frequency range and the cat even higher. I think a cat is 10 octaves and the dog is nine octaves from our hearing. Here's the velocity, which is very important. We'll be talking about uh, through a solid, um, through a fluid, you see it's 1540 meters per second and through a gas is really slow, 300 meters a second. The pulse echo, the pulse repetition frequency, uh, it's just really talking about the beginning, uh, the pulse repetition period is just the beginning of a pulse to the beginning of the next pulse. Uh, they're usually two to three cycles long and the pulse duration, the time it takes for one pulse to occur depends on a period and a number of cycles in the pulse. Then they will talk about duty factor, which is a fraction of time that pushed pulse ultrasound is on sonography. And then sonography is 1.0. Uh, the spatial pulse length, the length of the pulse from front to back, this is a wavelength times the number of cycles in a pulse. Uh, attenuation, as the ultrasound mechanically moves through certain tissues, different mediums, attenuation takes place. It's the gradual loss and intensity of flux through a medium. Uh, for example, sunlight is attenuated by dark sunglasses and x-ray is atten attenuated by lead. Right here, we see attenuation of ultrasound waves, which occurs in four different means. There's absorption through the body. There's reflection, which is coming back to the transducer. There's a scattering that happens, producing some artifacts. And then there's refraction, where we have a bent, much like you see the straw in the glass of water. Uh, attenuation is increased by higher frequency and shorter wavelengths. So you'll see, typically if you're in an apartment, you hear the bass from someone, your neighbor's stereo more often than you'll hear the higher frequencies. Reflection is the form of attenuation that is useful because without it, we would have no returning ultrasound and no information. Uh, the basis of reflection is the basis of pulse echo principle. So again, we're dealing with scatter, absorption, and refraction and reflection. The waves, uh, obviously with refraction, the waves do not return to the probe. Reflection, this important concept is caused by three things. The change in acoustic impedance, which is a mismatch going between say tissue through bone, smooth or specular reflectors and angle of insonation. The impedance, acoustic impedance, impedance is a measure of a material's tendency to transmit sound waves. So it is impacted by the elasticity and density of the material. A single material may have different Im impedances to different frequencies of a wave. So the mismatch happens uh, and occurs when a change in the impedance and reflection occurs. So I, let's say a person is yelling at a rock wall, the sound travels through the air and encounters rock and then it is reflected. In medical ultrasound, this occurs when going from liquid to a solid or a gas. So that's your impedance mismatch. The reflective surface is reflected best. The reflection happens when the surface is smooth. Uh, say for example, when you, a regular versus a foggy mirror or a furnished versus an unfurnished room. The angle of insonation. So surfaces at 90 degrees to the ultrasound beam generate reflection the best, uh, much like shining a flashlight into a water surface. Some laminar tissues, tendons and nerves are very good specular reflectors, such that when the angle of insonation is at 90 degrees, they generate a strong echo. But when the angle changes, the echo signal is completely lost. So this property is called anisotrophy. So here's an angle of insonation. So you see here, we've got the skin and we've got a needle going in through a vessel. So right here, we're gonna get a strong signal from the vessel, the blue tube, because it's perpendicular. We're gonna get a weak echo from the needle because we are, the anisotrophy is different. So here we have here, when we, move our transducer, now we're perpendicular to the needle and be highly reflective. We'll get a strong echo from the needle and a weak echo from the vessel. Um, some other ultrasound use different technology now, but most ultrasound is piezoelectric crystals are here. 
The crystals uh, transmit and receive. Uh, the crystal vibrates for short periods, a transmitter, you know, less than 1% of the time, and then it listens for the echoes to return about 99% of the time. The ultrasound probe, the, the, they're arranged in a certain array, the, the PZO electric crystals that create a plane of ultrasound waves and echoes. The operator will sweep the plane through the tissues for real-time images. So you can think of this sort of as a handheld CT scanner. Sectional images, sectional anatomy. So how do we get from these uh, pixelated molecules to a nice image in our ultrasound? So this is a process that happens with 3D localization. Transducer is an array of crystals aligned side by side, usually up to 256, creates a plane of ultrasound waves, and structures are localized by depth to time by detection of echo and direction with each crystal directional. So ultrasound modes, there's the basic modes, you guys know this. The B mode is, was named the brightness mode. That's why it's called the B mode. The 2D view most often used, the multiple side-by-side -side waves are transmitted, crystals listen, and the image is determined. That pixel is placed on the screen depends on the returning echo string, how bright it is, the direction, the horizontal axis, and the time elapsed. The increasing depth means the machine has to wait for echoes and perform more com computations and create a lower frame rate. Um, M mode, you guys are familiar with M mode. You use M mode a lot in cardiology. It's a single vector is drawn over time. So as we see here, the below is the M mode, the motion mode. Uh, the resulting image is, as mentioned before, our image depends on the strength, the direction, and the time elapse of the returning or reflected sound waves. If there's no reflection, no echo. That's typically what we term anechoic or black on the screen, a large reflection is a big echo that's coming back, bouncing and reflecting back is hyperechoic, which is usually white on the screen. And in between some reflection and some transmission, some echoes return, some don't, that's isoechoic, which is the gray on the screen. So here's the black or anechoic. So we see it passes through the anechoic structure. There's not a lot of reflectivity there and there's a shadow be below distal to the anechoic space, as you would see in usually doing a AAA exam here. Uh, here's an example. The fluid here is, is black and a good transmission of sound waves with no reflection. Hyperechoic is white, uh, very reflective. It will bounce back quickly, and this creates a anechoic or black shadow below it. As you see here in a gallstone, you see it's very reflective and it creates an acoustic shadow there. So here's a few examples of higher density objects like bone, stones reflect, are reflective and appear white. When material is dense and enough sound waves do not get through, this leads to, as we talked about earlier, acoustic shadowing. So you look at this image here, you got a gallbladder, um, you've got some non-reflectivity happening, and then below that you have posterior acoustic enhancement where you have the white shadow. Below the anechoic, you have the hyperechoic, and then over here you have the anechoic, and of course the density will create an uh, anechoic acoustic shadow. The more reflective structures appear light gray, and the less reflectives will appear dark gray. So this is what most of the human body is made of, uh, isoechoic grayscale. This what you'll see typically here is a Morrison's pouch shot. All right, back to physics a little bit. Reflection is strongest when going from an area of low acoustic impedance to high acoustic impedance. Remember the change in the impedance equals the reflection and becomes wide on the screen. Sound waves traveling through the liver. We like the liver because it's homogeneous and low acoustic impedance, it's dark gray. The gallbladder wall has a higher impedance, therefore many sound waves are reflected and it appears white, as you can see there. Uh, so what causes these stronger or weaker echoes? The, the reflections occur at points where there are changes in acoustic impedance, sonographic elect elasticity and density, in addition, there's two qualities of interfaces that affect their echogenicity. There's good specular reflectors, as we talked about before, an empty room versus a furnished room. You can hear a lot more 
bounce back from sound and the angle of uncination. So what happens to this ultrasound beam as it passes through these tissues? As the waves propagate mechanically through a medium, they are attenuated. There's a scatter, there's a reflection, uh, which is a special case of scatter. There's absorption, which generates heat. And how can we compensate for these signal attenuation? Well, the distant echoes are weaker than the near field, the far field, the near field. The ultrasound machine progressively amplifies later, more distant echo signals to compensate. This is what you see in the time gain correction, TGCs. Um, minor gain adjustments are also made by the sonographer only on lar larger machines typically, although they have some presets now in an instrument uh, like a butterfly. You can slot, do some sliders, much like a stereo. So here's a, a time gain uh, compensation here. Here's no, uh, no TGCs. You can see how the returning echoes, the echoes are much more reflective in the near field and in the far field as we go distal, they're weaker. When you have the TJC and you typically do the curve, you'll have a lot stronger reflectivity back to the transducer head. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit here now about ultrasound artifacts, uh, which are seen in both normal and pathologic situations. So we'll talk about five, acoustic shadowing, uh, posterior acoustic enhancement, uh, the gain artifact and the mirror artifact and the reverberation artifact. So here's uh, some artifact that they call artifact, but you can use this to make diagnosis. Your acoustic shadowing, it will tell you the density of a structure. If it creates a, a anechoic shadow, then you know that's typically uh, a fluid filled sort of cyst it occurs, you know, behind highly reflective or highly attenuating objects, bones, calcifications, and gas, you know, that's very dense. Uh, it also creates posterior acoustic enhancement. As you see a lot here, the reflectivity creates a white shadow below it. Just a note on one of the artifacts that can, you know, mess you up. Say you're doing a abdominal trauma or an EFAST behind the bladder in a fast exam, you may cause your failure to see, identify the free fluid. If it's so bright and there was a little fluid there from uh, internal bleeding around the bladder, it would occlude uh, the anechoic space. That's called post PAE or posterior acoustic enhancement. The gain artifact, pretty simple. Uh, there's too much gain. Turn the gain down by setting the gain structure so there would be black fluid would appear black. This is a typical example of something that's way over gained. Um, there's a, a lateral cystic edge shadow here, which you'll see. It just creates a shadow off of it when the ultrasound beam is off of oval structure like this. Here's an example here of an aorta. You'll see uh, edge shadow on either side. Mirror artifact, pretty common. You guys are probably aware of this. And uh, here's a sagittal view of a right upper quadrant. You'll see it's, it's a, typically a normal artifact and absence indicates disease. So uh, typically if you don't see that reflection and you see that dark anechoic in the pleural space, you'll, you'll think uh, there's some pleural fluid there. Again, another flat, highly reflective structure. So you a lot of mirror artifact here. Uh, reverberation artifact is caused by the echo bouncing back and forth between two or more highly reflective surfaces. On the monitor, the parallel bands of reverberation echoes are seen in a comet tail pattern. Common sources are abdominal wall, foreign bodies, and gas. And also, we see this a lot now, and we use it to differentiate in lung ultrasound. We'll see the comet tails, uh, commonly known as. Uh, you know, your A line, your horizontal, or your B lines would be your comet tails. Here's a reverberation artifact, an example here, how it reflects back and forth and bounces back. Uh, the reverb sounds, you know, if you listen to it in the sound, say in some music, they'll have reverb where they're recording something and it boun it's bouncing in the room and you'll hear a, a large echo. That's a reverberation artifact. That's what's happening. The sound is bouncing as it's doing here with the transducer. Okay, here's a couple of conventions, conventions of the image layout. Each probe has an index marker. Uh, it's, it's a pointer which indicates which side of the image will be projected on the right side of the screen. So you wanna get your orientation down. 
Uh, here's an index marker here on over here. You'll see one on a phased array here is con convex phased array. So you want to orient your index marker, which correlates with the dot upon the sector at the screen. And what we usually talk, talk about, you know, in uh, ultrasound is we either speak in transverse, which you have the index marker here pointed away from the patient. Actually, if you're right-handed pointing towards you, it's a good, good way to uh, the sonographer to notate that. Uh, the beam will go straight through the patient, uh, however you hold it. And you'll have a picture here uh, of the abdominal aorta. So this is a transverse view. Here's what it looks like on the abdominal aorta. And here it is cutting through uh, for a AAA evaluation. Now we'll take the same view and we'll have the index marker pointed cephalically towards the patient's head. This is a longitudinal view. Uh, as you see it, it goes through the body in such a manner and it creates a longitudinal, longitudinal view of the aorta here. So we, we speak, of, we don't really speak of coronal or sagittal, that's more the body. When we talk about ultrasound, we're either talking about two things, transverse or longitudinal. Here's a, a, some anatomy here of an abdominal aorta shot here in a longitudinal plane. Okay, here's the Barbary Castle, June 1st, 2008. Uh, what you see here, it was interesting, the crop circle here. Uh, it was a geographic representation of pi. It's cut up in pi sectors. There was actually a telescope manufacturer that did lens that figured this out, what this was actually about. And you can see if you start up there in the red one, two, three, and then there's a decimal point, boom, then one, two, three, four. And then subsequently it goes all the way out, pi to 10 digits using a rotary encoder. This is pretty fascinating. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, I hope we have some time for questions. Uh, Dara, thank you for facilitating this, guys. I hope I didn't go too fast. This is basic ultrasound physics in 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Oh, and this is a picture of me at the Hackpenny uh, Crop Circle in Wiltshire, England, 2018. Thank you so much, James. Uh, this was great. Thank you so much for uh, the information. We already had people commenting. Uh, but before we go into the q and I want to um, uh, launch some polls and test some knowledge, what we covered, um, and see uh, we have a couple of questions that we uh, want to ask you guys. Um, so the first question is, uh, what section do first-time ultrasound registry test takers fail the most? And uh, you should see the poll questions right now, and uh, feel free to answer it. We'll leave it open for about 30 seconds. And um, yeah, it's a little fun uh, exercise. And I see... Um, the answers are coming in. We have about 50% participants who answered the question. So we'll just wait a little bit more. Okay. All right, here's the results. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> James, what do you think? <laughs> I think he, uh, just, it just points out that uh, one of the main reasons people typically fail, whether you're a sonographer or you're taking POCUS fundamentals, is the ultrasound physics, um, how the machine works, the, the science of medical physics, ultrasound, Archimedes principle, you know, continuity equations, these kind of things throw people off the most. So I would spend my time in physics world. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, we have another question real quick. Um, what is the average velocity through the human body that device manufacturers set at? So let's see. Again, we're launching this question. We'll give about 30 seconds to respond. Uh, the answers are coming in. So hopefully you guys caught, uh, caught that while James was um, covering this. So I'll give another 10 seconds. All right. Here we are with the results. 
James? Very good work. Um, what's interesting about this is through the human body is made up of different structures, blood, gas, tissue, bones. So each of these have a different velocity. So the manufacturer has a problem when they're making an ultrasound machine. Now, how do we average this out? So it might look good if we're looking at gas. It might look bad if we're looking at bones. So what they do is they average this out to 1540 meters a second through the human body. Uh, that's typically how they average it. But when they do this process, that's what creates artifacts because it cannot be perfect. So they average it out and the resulting of that, you just have to be aware of a few, you know, a handful of crucial ultrasound artifacts. Thank you, James, for, for sharing these tips. Um, okay, one, two more questions. Um, who did, okay, who do you suppose makes the crop circles? <laughs> James loves the crop circles, <laughs> the fun one. Um, there's a lot of, uh, great options here, you know. <laughs> it's all connected, right, James? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting, you know. I've been in them and they're magical and they're real. Sure, there are some that are made by artists that hire for a corporate logo. Maybe they'll do a Volkswagen thing. Those aren't real. Um, <laughs> They try to say, well, I'll wait till everyone sees. I'm very curious. Uh, I like to keep the question open. It's a big mystery. They're all over. They're in snow. They're in other fields all over the world. They're the upper reachers of Mongolia and Russia. Um, there really is no correct answer here, guys. Right. <laughs> guys, it's ropes. <laughs> yeah, a couple of guys have a few beers in the pub, and they go out with plywood and ropes. And thing. <laughs> so, uh People really don't know. The question remains open. Why are they always in England and why always in September and August? Well, the tourism board is not behind it. There's no big conspiracy there. Uh, they think that it's the giant underwater aquifer. And if you think of the white cliffs of Dover, they're very chalky. And that's a very great transducer, like the one you hold in your hand for sound <laughs> waves. So Perfect. thanks well, a lot, guys. Thank uh, you. Uh, I just have one more um, question for the audience and you guys can keep answering um, this poll. I'll leave it open and we'll just move towards our Q and A. Just, uh, we had a couple of people um, had uh, some questions. Um, um, so we have um, a question from Akbar. Uh, good basic understanding, radio opaque substances does tend to be black. How is the reflection of waves there? So, uh, I, I don't really understand the question. I guess the, you know, the anechoic areas of the body are typically fluid filled. So you would see a cyst, a gallbladder, uh, and, and a lot like paintings, there's a uh, lights to darks. You go from whites to grays to black, like a charcoal sketch. But why are they, ultimately black, um, the waves pass through it. They actually speed up. And when they reach the other side, they create a more of a re reflectivity. I, I guess that's the gist of that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question it was from Sadat. Uh, how to reduce the slice thickness artifacts? The, sl the slice thickness artifacts. Yes. I'm not sure, but I will say this. The first thing that you do with your patient, if you're not getting a good image on your patient, most of the time people reach for a knob. That's our human intuition. I think it's better to adjust the patient, roll the patient, have them take a deep breath, raise the arm, spread the ribs out to get your phased array up in there for a cardiac shot, bend the knees so they can relax, get past muscles, uh, so usually the first move is that move. Your next move is you want to adjust possibly just two things. You want to adjust only the depth. So you want to either increase or decrease the depth. You don't want to get too close because you may exclude pathology. You want to have it just, just so. And the gain, you want to have your gain, you know, in the middle there for isoechoic imaging right there. Not too high, not too low. Thank you, James, for those tips. I don't know if I answered the slice question, but that's 
Well, it, and if you want a little bit more clarification, feel free to email us at the focus uh, inbox. Uh, we're happy to connect and answer some questions. Uh, we just got in one more. Can you elaborate on the mirror artifact and how, why it occurs? Okay, so the mirror artifact is, uh, that's the biggest artifact you guys will see. So the liver is a, a large structure in our body. It's relatively flat from most of the typical angles that people are looking at it, right upper quadrant or subcostally. Um, when the ultrasound beam hits that, it's flat and it's perpendicular. So it's highly reflective and it creates a mirror artifact. So it folds it over. And if there's, a, the mirror artifact happens on the liver, that's probably the number one artifact that you'll encounter. A lot of times you can judge pathology if you don't see the reflectivity of the mirror artifact. And typically that's a pleural effusion if it's only anechoic right there. So you can actually use, like all these artifacts, you can use these artifacts if you understand and know when, when you encounter them. So you, you can use that to help with your differential diagnosis. You can drill down and say, okay, this is a cyst, or this is a calcification, or this is a fluid-filled cyst, or this is spongy, isochoic, it, it might be cancerous. Um, you can look at something highly reflective, it would be calcium, uh, gallstones, things of that nature, and again, with the mirror artifact. Perfect, thank you, James. It's a great discussion, and um, I see there are a couple of people asking if we are open to do a basic ultrasound use in pre-hospital setting. Um, again, you can contact us for some details. We can set up a call with you and uh, discuss the opportunities. And one more question was about, do you lecture on cardiac ultrasound physics and discuss artifacts created by the structural heart devices and valve replacements? Uh, this is a great suggestion. We will look into it and uh, maybe bring this topic to our next uh, Focus Byte webinar series which happens um, every month. Um, so we try to uh, bring uh, hot topics to you. And if you have any more suggestions, feel free to email us. We're here uh, to support you and provide you with educational resources. And um, I don't see any more additional uh, questions. Uh, James, do you have anything to add? I see a quick one about ultrasound physics and artifacts caused by heart devices and valve replacements. That's a good one. There's a lot of that. I've seen a lot over the years. Uh, the St. Jude, anything metal is highly reflective. You can sort of get in the apical four chamber. You can really evaluate it there. It makes it difficult for color Doppler because it scatters and pixelates the reflectivity. It makes it difficult. You can turn your gain down on your color and change your angle uh, of your transducer. Um, your bio valves, typically porcine or bovine or human, um, they're not reflective at all because they're not made of a high, high reflectivity. They're mostly appear isoechoic. And, and those are just general things. It, it would be great to, uh, maybe a manufacturer can have a filter so we can see paravalvular leaks around the stitching or if the the vow has become unseated. That would be great. Maybe one of the medical manufacturers will do such. All right. Uh, thank you, James. Um, I'm just double checking for more questions and uh, if we got anything. I hope I answered that as best I could, guys. You know, I don't. I don't want you to think like I sound like a politician that I'm dodging this. A lot of these. Uh, Radio opaque substance tend to be black and how is the reflection of waves there? That, that was a really good question. And I think I'll have to do a little bit more book work to answer that completely from Akbar, but thank you. Thank you so much, James, again, for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here and um, covering this topic. I know it can be a lot of information, but I think um, just putting that in 30 minutes uh, was great. It's just a little bites. And just a reminder, um, uh, we have Focus Fundamental Certificate that covers uh, basics um, of Focus Ultrasound that you can take. Uh, the certificate also includes learning modules that you can go through. And after that, you will be able to pass the assessment. So this is a great way to um, 
just um, gain the, the new skills and then get a certification um, as well. So if you're interested, please um, let us know. Uh, we will be able to share some more information with you and email us at any time at Pocus Inbox. So uh, thank you again. That wraps our session today. A recording of this webinar will be made available on our website, focus.org. Uh, and it will be available uh, approximately uh, in one week. You will get an email with a reminder. And again, thank you so much for attending our webinar today. And we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. Thank you.